So ask yourself the question. People who know you, would they know you as someone who trusts God, who obeys God, someone who attempts to walk in His will, or do they just know you as a person who sort of just does whatever comes naturally and you want to be happy and you want to be successful and you want to fit into the ways of the world? God did not allow you to be born just to do any old thing you wanted to do. That wasn't His plan. Watch carefully as the Apostle John defines darkness in his context. Darkness comes in a lot of different ways, but what John's talking about here is understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you will acknowledge that work and agree with what the Holy Ghost is doing in your life, you won't walk in darkness. Two years have passed since the Pharaoh freed the cupbearer and restored his life and executed the baker by execution of hanging. From chapter 40 to chapter 41, two years has passed by and the Pharaoh himself has a dream. Pharaoh's dream had him standing by the Nile River then out of the river come seven cows, fine looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then another seven cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. Research reveals that the two Hebrew phrases used here can literally be interpreted as terrible, looking and thin of flesh. It was a life-like experience, and while it was a dream, it was also a message from God. Pharaoh wakes up and knows that the experience was not just a random event, and was troubled by it. After falling asleep, he has another dream this time, he saw seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. The King James Version, which we typically use here on Dig In Deeper, uses the word corn instead of grain, but during this period of history, corn did not exist. This does not mean that it's an error, but an example of how language can change things. As in the first dream, there were seven cows and another seven came forth. Here, there are seven crops of grain or corn and then another seven ears thin and blighted by the east wind, so it appears the second set of seven grain heads seen by Pharaoh look like they've been parched and ruined by this blasting desert wind. Pharaoh's actions let us know that he knows something about the dreams were troubling. And if the dreams were more than just dreams, ruined crops could be catastrophic. Before he wakes up, he sees the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. What could this mean for Pharaoh? Pharaoh was uncertain and troubled by the dreams, so he sent forward for anyone who could help, including magicians and advisors, or wise men. He knew something wasn't right and wanted to understand what. During ancient cultures such as Egypt, there existed a lot of false traditions like medicines, spiritism, and mysticism mixed with religion as methods to reach the divine. In the previous chapter, Joseph had said that knowledge of dreams belonged to God. And while Pharaoh knew something was not right, he did not have the knowledge to go to God to interpret these dreams. The ways in which he went about interpreting the dreams were unable to reveal deeper knowledge and meaning, and when there was no real answer given, the cupbearer spoke up and mentioned the name of Joseph. He tells the Pharaoh of his experience when he and the baker were thrown into jail and had dreams that confused them both, but Joseph had accurately interpreted them. Pharaoh had to be impressed by this. And while we are unsure whether he believed the cupbearer completely, he was desperate, so he sent for Joseph. The old saying desperate times call for desperate measure. And while the other methods had failed, 
Perhaps Joseph can be of assistance. We are not told, but maybe Pharaoh trusted this man and sent for Joseph without hesitation. Although the cupbearer did mention Joseph's name to Pharaoh, it took him two years to do so. And when Pharaoh sent for Joseph, he shaved and changed his clothes and came in unto Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells Joseph that he is a dream and needs an interpret, but nobody can do so. But he has heard of the good works from Joseph. But Joseph responds that it's God, not him, that can give a good answer. Pharaoh tells Joseph the dreams that he had and the visions that he saw. Joseph listens and responds. The dream of Pharaoh is one: God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do, or God means to show Pharaoh exactly what he is about to do on the earth. Joseph further explains the seven thin cows, and seven thin heads of grain represent a second time period, one of famine. This shortage will be so severe that it will entirely undo the seven years of abundance. And while this may not be good news whatsoever, the situation can turn dire really quick. There is hope, as Pharaoh knows, so he can act accordingly. There will be good times. And bad times, as seven years of prosperity will be upon the land, but followed by seven years of famine. The famine will be horrendous, as it will devastate and consume the land of Egypt. The situation will be so bad that all the good that had been experienced prior will be forgotten. And because Pharaoh had two dreams, these events will come to pass and quickly. The events were fixed, and there's no reversing the decisions. Joseph does inform the Pharaoh that he needed to put together a team of wise and discerning men to manage the crisis that will fall upon the land, and he does. Joseph informs them to collect one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. This should serve to us as a lesson to be prepared for bad times as an emergency. It is not beneath any of us, and Joseph. Was teaching the Pharaoh and his people to be prepared for what was about to come. The food collected during the good times will serve as reserves during the bad times. While Pharaoh may not have liked hearing what was to come, he took Joseph's advice and did what was instructed, asking if there was anyone else in the land that was filled with God. When Pharaoh refers to Joseph as a man like this, he's not being condescending. Or belittling Joseph, but he understands that Joseph is full of knowledge and full of God's spirit. Pharaoh goes as far in saying to Joseph, "Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou." Here, Pharaoh appoints Joseph to be his second in command over all of Egypt. Think about how quick things had changed for Joseph. He woke up in the morning in prison after two years of interpreting dreams for two men, and now he's being summoned to interpret dreams for the Pharaoh, and then being made second in command. When God says the time is right. Nobody can stop what is coming, which was true for what would hit Egypt, and for each individual striving for God's plan. Pharaoh repeated his plans for Joseph, and repeating something more than once was an indication of importance to illustrate to Joseph the changing of status. And his token of appreciation, Pharaoh hands over his signet ring as well as fine clothes and a gold chain. His life has truly changed. Joseph was not only dressing differently, as a high-ranking official in Egypt was expected to look a certain way, but he was also traveling differently, as he was riding in one of Pharaoh's chariots. Pharaoh addresses just how much authority Joseph has, explaining, "I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt." Joseph has his name changed and is given a wife from Pharaoh. His name was changed to Zaphnepania, 
and he gave him to wife Asenath the daughter of Potiphar a priest of on. This may have been the same Potiphar who Joseph worked for and later arrested Joseph. There is a lot of research that indicates this may be the same guy. But we are not sure as his whereabouts after Genesis chapter 39. The name change has been discussed. And while there is not a consensus about the name, it translates to something similar to someone that God speaks to or a revealer of secrets. When all of this happens, Joseph was 30 years old, which means from the time he was arrested and imprisoned and this list of events, 13 years had passed. Joseph leaves Egypt and the seven years of prosperity does occur and he collects the food as he instructed. The Bible tells us that Joseph gathered up and stored as much food as the sand of the sea. That's truly a lot. Before the famine hit, Joseph had two children from Asenna. The firstborn Manasseh translating as God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. And the second Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. As God had informed Joseph, the seven years of prosperity would end and the famine would hit. It did. But when it did, there was bread in Egypt. The people cried for bread during this famine and Pharaoh told the people to go to Joseph and do as he instructed them. Pharaoh had complete confidence in Joseph. Despite the measure of collecting money through taxes, the Egyptians did not starve and had food to eat during this trying time. The famine was a worldwide event and people from all over came to Egypt to buy from Joseph. And this would increase Egypt greatly which seemed to happen to anything and everything Joseph touched. Spurgeon writes in regards to Genesis chapter 41 verses 1 through 7. Pharaoh's nightmare has too often been my waking experience. My days of laziness have ruinously destroyed all that I had achieved in times of zealous industry. My seasons of coldness have frozen all the genial glow of my periods of fervency and enthusiasm. And my fits of worldliness have thrown me back from my advances in the divine life. I needed to beware of lean prayers, lean praises, lean duties, and lean experiences because these will eat up the fat of my comfort and peace. If I neglect prayer for ever so short a time, I lose all the spirituality to which I had attained. If I draw no fresh supplies from heaven, the old corn in my granary is soon consumed by the famine that rages in my soul. When the caterpillars of indifference or worldliness or self-indulgence completely desolate my heart and make my soul languish, then all my former fruitfulness and growth in grace avails me nothing whatsoever. How anxious should I be to have no lean flesh days, no ill-favored hours, if every day I journeyed towards the goal of my desires, I would soon reach it. But backsliding leaves me still far away from the prize of my high calling. It robs me of the advances which I had so laboriously made. The only way in which all my days can be like the sleek fat cows is to keep feeding them in the right meadow, to keep spending them with the Lord in His service, in His company, in His fear, and in His way. Why should not every year be richer than the past in love and usefulness and joy? I am closer to the celestial hills. I have had more experience of my Lord. And I should be more like Him. O oh Lord, keep far from me the curse of leanness of soul. Do not let me have to cry my leanness. My leanness, woe unto me. But may I be well fed and nourished in your house that I may praise your name. Genesis 42 shifts away, somewhat, from Joseph back to his family in Canaan. The end of chapter 41 revealed a worldwide flood, and this was impacting Jacob and Joseph's brothers. News reached Joseph's family back in Canaan that you can buy grain in Egypt. But what they do not know is Joseph is second in command. 
Ten of Jacob's sons head to Egypt. He had twelve, but Joseph was already in Egypt. And Benjamin was left behind. The reason for not sending Benjamin was Jacob did not want to lose another child, especially one that belonged to Rachel. Think about what has been done over the last twenty years, including God. Using Joseph's ability to interpret dreams to place him as second in command over the entire nation. When the brothers arrived in Egypt, they bowed down to him. But this does mean they knew it was Joseph. In fact, they didn't recognize him, but they were in a position of need. And typically, when you're in need, you become humble. They did. Joseph recognized his brothers, but he did not acknowledge them asking where they came from. At this point Joseph is nearly forty and wearing official Egyptian clothing. Seeing his brothers made Joseph think of them, remember his youth. At first, Joseph accuses his brothers of being foreign spies, which was a crime punishable by death. If the brothers were spies, the meaning of nakedness of the land would imply they were sent to determine the vulnerabilities of the land. The brothers do deny being spies, but admit to being there to buy food. They refer to themselves as servants, which can be seen as one sign Joseph's dreams were coming. True as they bowed down before Joseph. Jacob had used the same tactic with Esau referring to himself as Esau's servant despite having the birthright and his position. The brothers do not recognize Joseph by appearance. But his name has been changed to Zaphonath Paneah, and it seems like Joseph wants revenge would be hard to blame Joseph for all that has been done to him. But his brothers insist they are not spies, but honest people wanting to buy food. Joseph reiterates they have come to determine the vulnerabilities of Egypt. But the response was surprising. It was said they were of twelve brothers of one man from Canaan, but one is no more. Joseph has to be pleased knowing Benjamin and Jacob were alive. And his brothers even remembered him, but why does Joseph keep insisting they were up to no good? Joseph makes a demand of his brothers to bring their youngest brother to him, or they will not return home. Now it's apparent that Joseph is testing his brothers, send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved. There's no way Joseph could have planned this beforehand. But Kong that Benjamin was alive makes him want to see his brother again. Joseph puts his brothers into custody for three days. But his actions are not as some dictator out for blood. But a loving brother who wants to see his brother. Benjamin was Joseph's only full brother as both parents were the same. His other ten brothers were from Jacob but through different moms. He tells the brothers to do as instructed, and they will live. Joseph knows the situation from the famine has been a dire one, so he tells his brothers to leave. One behind, and the other nine leave with their grain, which reversed his original plan. He instructs clearly to bring your brother, in order to verify their honesty. But this is still a strange request. The brothers come to the conclusion they are punished for their wrongdoing to their other brother. Joseph, who they claim is no more. Reuben points out he was against the whole plan and alludes to his other brothers being responsible and blood was the price to pay. Remember, the brothers did not know Joseph was Joseph, so they assumed he was unable to understand their language, but Joseph overheard them and knew what they were saying. They were able to communicate prior because they used an interpreter. He went away, wept due to what he had heard, and took Simeon into custody. And the other brothers left. They leave with instructions for their journey. Another fact the brothers do not yet know. Joseph returned their money. They will soon find the money, but when the money is found, they begin to panic. They do not know Joseph returned the money but somehow forgot to pay him and thought it was part of their punishment 
for what had happened nearly thirty years ago. They arrive home in Canaan and tell Jacob what happened, including the governor calling them spies and instructing them back home to retrieve their brother, Benjamin. They take their grain without knowing they still had their money. Jacob, hearing of the story, lashed out at the brothers holding them responsible for the loss of Joseph and now, Simeon. We are uncertain of exactly why Jacob lashed out at his sons. Reuben makes a bold command telling Jacob they will deliver Benjamin back to him. But if they do not, Jacob can kill his own two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, but Jacob refuses to send Benjamin. And it seems Jacob is saying it's better to count Simeon lost than to risk losing Benjamin. This declaration must have been extremely difficult for his other sons to hear a favoritism as it is never easy to hear and accept. Jacob has convinced himself losing Benjamin would cause his death. Charles Spurgeon wrote, in regards to the need for corn in comparison to grace, a pitiful plight. These sons of Jacob were overtaken by a famine. We may talk of famines, friends, but none of us know what they are. We have heard of a famine in Ireland, and some dreadful stories have been related to us that have harrowed our hearts and almost made our hair stand up on end, but even there the full fury of famine was not known. We have heard too, to our great grief, that there are still in this city dark and hideous spots where men and women are absolutely perishing from hunger, who have sold from off their backs the last rags that covered them, and are now unable to leave the house, and positively perishing of famine. Such cases we have seen in our daily journals. And our hearts have been sick to think that such things should now occur. But we cannot any of us guess what is the terror of an universal famine when all men are poor. Because all men lack bread when gold and silver are as valueless as the stones of the street because mountains of silver and gold would scarce suffice to buy a single sheaf of wheat. Read the history of the famine of Samaria and see the dreadful shifts to which women were driven when they did even eat their own offspring. Famines are hells on earth. The famine which had overtaken Jacob was one which, if it had not at the moment of which this passage speaks, exactly arrived at that dreadful pitch, was sure to come to it for the famine was to last for seven years. And if, through the spendthrift character of eastern nations, they had not saved in the seven years of plenty enough even for one year. What would become of them during the sixth or seventh year of famine? This was the state of Jacob's family. They were cast into a waste, howling wilderness of famine with but one oasis. And that oasis they did not hear of till just at the time to which our text refers. When they learned to their joy that there was corn in Egypt, Permit me now to illustrate the condition of the sinner by the position of these sons of Jacob. First, the sons of Jacob had a very great need of bread. There was a family of sixty-six of them. We are apt, when we read these names of the sons of Jacob, to think they were all lads. Are you aware that Benjamin, the youngest of them, was the father of ten children? At the time he went into Egypt, so that he was not so very small a lad at any rate. And all the rest had large families, so that there were sixty-six to be provided for. Well, a famine is frightful enough when there is one man who is starving when there is one brought down to a skeleton through leanness and hunger, but when sixty-six mouths are craving for bread. That is indeed a horrible plight to be in. But what is this compared with the sinner's needs? His necessities are such that only infinity can supply them. He has a demand before which the demands of sixty-six mouths are as nothing. He has before him the dreadful anticipation of a hell. From which there is no escape, he is upon him the heavy hand of God, who has condemned him on account of his sins. 
This is where we come to an end of our Bible study today in Genesis chapter 42. We are nearing the end of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. There have been so many historical events covered throughout the first 42 chapters of Genesis. There is no telling what the next studies will reveal so join us next time for our Bible. Study here on Digging Deeper as we simply dig deeper into the Word of God. If you like what you just watched, like and share our content. It really helps us grow. And think about subscribing to our channel, which will help you keep up to date with all of our content. Once again, I am your host Billy Ray Parrish. And until next time, thank you for joining us. Stay safe and God bless.